This time around for The Journey, joined by Josh Baker from b Homes. Hello and welcome to The Journey. Thanks, Kev. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, always start with heritage to the area. Uh, let's talk about your family name is a familiar one. The business is a familiar one, which we'll get to in a moment. But uh, tell us about your ties to Albury, Wodonga. Uh, how local are you? Were you born here? All the rest. Yep. Born and bred. Uh, grew up around... Bellbridge, Bethanga, Telgano area, and um, yeah, schooled in Wodonga, went to St. Augustine's and Catholic College. Yeah, I've um, yeah studied, did uni here, uh, certainly grounded with footy. I love, passionate about it. I, I love my footy in the days, played juniors with the Raiders, then um, crossed over to the arch rival in Wodonga and played my senior career. Um, and I just love the area. Once I retired from playing footy, I probably grew in love with the region even more so because of... It's beauty. I got to actually really, you know, spend the weekends enjoying what we have. It's, yeah, I'm really attached to it. It's a common theme that we've found on the journey talking to different people in Aubrey Wodonga. You know, they they just love the region. They're proud of it. And it's good to hear the same from you. Uh, Now, you are currently the owner of B&H Homes. But uh, tell us a bit more about the story behind the business. uh, Because your father and others involved in obviously getting it started before you were technically full-time involved. Yeah, it began way back. It's a 42-year-old business wow. uh, back in 78. So uh, it was my dad, my uncle, and Max Hindges. So they formed what became Baker and Hindges Homes. It started off uh, as uh, they were all working independently, separately. Max and Julian, my dad, were subbing, actually working at Murray High School. And... Um, Back in those days, it was you know work was pretty tough to come by. They were they were going pretty hard. They worked out that they complemented each other really well. In that, Dad was good on the roofs. Max not so much. He was scared of heights. So <laughs> Dad's name was Sparrow, for good reason. Max probably could have been named Emu, but um, yeah, he was more of the ground sort of bird. <laughs> but they yeah they quickly built up a rapport. They um, yeah and and started to go into partnership. As subbies, John at that same time was subbying. Uh, sorry, was supervising um, for Vinden Swa, and um, and so they found their path. They realised that, as I said, you know, that they wanted to control their own destiny. To do that was to build in their own right, as opposed to fight for work, which was you know difficult to come by. Um, and so they approached Worsley Black and Partners back in the day. So they were assigned a young cadet in Steve Mamuni. May even have had hair that I'm not certain, but it would have been a long time ago. <laughs> Steve actually set Max and Julian on the path to get their Victorian license. So he sent them down to Melbourne and, and got them started. Um, so once they achieved that with John and his New South Wales license, which he had already held, they were able to join forces and, and start building in their own right. And so they did that. As any infancy, any business in its infancy does, had to crawl before they walk. So they they started doing private builds whilst they were subbing, and gradually grew it to become a, a yeah very successful business. Yeah, let's talk about your involvement. Um, before we got started today, you mentioned you grew up on building sites. Um, so what's your qualification now, and and leading into I guess that building industry? How did you get involved? Yeah, I wasn't. Although I grew up. In the game, like quite literally, I, I mean, it wouldn't be done today, but, you know, in times when I needed to be minded, mum had to do something, I was on site with dad. So can fondly remember those times, but it was something as I went through school, I, I probably didn't realize at the time that this would be my vocation. And it certainly seems funny now, but I think other people knew before I did. I mean, as, as a kid, I used to love drawing houses other than footy players as well, you know, the caricatures, I used to love it. But back then I didn't realize I resisted it. I went to uni. I had this core um, desire. I just wanted to help people. I thought that conduit was going to be as a physio or psychologist or something. So I went and studied psychology. Uh, Got to about the last semester of that and I wasn't 100% on it. And dad said to me, you know, he's pretty um, blunt as, you know, and fair. And and he said, look, you got three months. We need to employ someone. Do you want to be a part of it? And I hadn't really thought too much about it, but it certainly made me really delve into what did I really want to do? And so I had a bit of a change in shift and I really worked. It was funny. I didn't know why I had to work hard on myself to work it out, but I did. And I had a shift in mindset in that absolutely at its fundamental 
reason, it's putting roof overhead. It's a real fundamental need for any human. So I thought, yeah, why not? There's a pretty good potential here to help out. Did you Maybe finish you the psychology some... degree first? Yeah, you... I did. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, did. I did the last couple of months. <laughs> but I didn't know until the very, you know, towards that end part and it became really obvious to me that, yeah, no, I want to I want to give this a crack. I, you know, I absolutely love everything that B&H stood for. I mean, so in my holidays, I would be laboring as a chippy anyway. Um, throughout uni, uh, I would work as the display home cleaner for B&H home anyway. So at the end, it was probably a really natural progression, but I didn't see it that way. I had to finish my studies off. I did that and... Deeply, yeah, have fallen in love with the game. Yeah, the industry is a really interesting one. I mean, it's tough and uh, like any is anything that's worth it is, you've got to work for it. But yeah, architecture, construction, um, the impact that it can have and, and also, yeah, the, the absolute, yeah, that, that fundamental need that, you know, we can probably have an impact on, um, which, you know, there's a few of that at the moment, isn't there? You know, yeah. with housing uh, population growth, all of that, like it's needed. So yeah, there's some bigger dreams there at the end of the day, but at the same time at this point, moment in time, yeah, I, I absolutely, um, yeah, I'm so proud to head up being H Homes. It's something that, yeah, it's just feels right. And what was the turning point for them? Like when they went from just sort of coming together, um, and, and sort of being able to trade in both States, I guess, what, when did it really start taking off for them? Are you familiar with that sort of background? Yeah. The rubber hit the road, I suppose. There's moments, isn't there, in time where, where it happens. And, and they so they chipped away, like I said, for quite a while. So Max, John, Julian, through the 80s, would have done about five display homes before the one, I suppose, that really made an impact. That was the Bell Rose. It's the B&H look that you probably uh, are familiar with. If you drive past one, you know it. Um, that was probably where it all happened. So much time was invested into that design. I remember as a kid, the lounge room table was just scattered with clippings, sketches, plans. They used to frequently commute to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Melbourne was probably in those days, it was a couple of years ahead of where we are in the regional town. So they really invested heavily into a look that they wanted to be really unique. Something that was a cross between Federation, Victorian, and then regional. So they wanted to be able to get that blend. It was that quintessential b h look, which became the Bell Rose. Yeah, I remember speaking to Dad about it. It was quite a risk to do it. They obviously invested everything that they had worked for to that point to actually do it because it became, you know, um, quite a, a stunning display home. But a risk at the same time because they invested so much. But because he look, he put it down to youthful exuberance and everything else. But <laughs> but at the same time, you know, when you you yeah, he they were so well researched in it. I think they were so comfortable too, and they were really happy with how unique it was. That they were just they thought it was going to work, and it did. And it took off in our market. Yeah, it did. You know, they were driven to be the Mercedes Benz, I suppose, of you know the, the housing. They really wanted to to offer that in the marketplace, and yeah, and that they did. Yeah. So you're three years into ownership now, is that right, of the business? Yes. How are you finding that? Yeah, it's, look, it was a gradual progression and it was a succession that was always coming. So when I came into the business, it wasn't necessarily that I was going to take it over. Uh, I, I So like I said, I, my progression was from cleaner. Uh, I was a, yeah, Chibi's labourer. I became an estimator when I actually made that decision that I referred to after uni. Uh, worked in every role in the business thereafter. Uh, so in terms of, yeah, a little bit of design, supervision, construction management, estimating administration, contracts, all that stuff. So got a really good grounding for it. I knew probably in about, you know, five or so years in, you know, I've nearly been there coming up 20 years. So it was always the game plan pretty much. So the succession was natural. So three years, although... I've been three years solo. I was with dad a couple of years before that, I suppose, in directorship, even though dad was certainly, you know, holding the reins. I was there just uh, sous chef. And <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's been a really natural progression and something that I've, yeah, I've reveled in. I love the challenge. I love the, the yeah, 
it's a multifaceted industry. Are you glad you're doing that instead of psychology? <laughs> Some would say I'm still practicing psychology. <laughs> 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 no, no, definitely. Yeah, I, it never really, it never really grabbed me through the study. I mean, that was probably a, a, another reason why the decision when I look back is like, what did I? So you know, so agonise over it. But it was, mm. yeah, it was just, it was meant to be. Yeah. Um, what do you like on the tools? Have you got any <laughs> the practical side in you? Or? It's scratchy. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I was the labourer. <laughs> I only was, uh, yeah, I was throwing things around, that's for sure. It was um, just helping out where I could. I wouldn't say I was the brains of the operation. <laughs> we're on the journey of Josh Baker from B&H Homes. And we've heard uh, there was that one pivotal design that really got the rubber on the road uh, for B&H Homes to, to become the recognisable uh, buildings within Albury Wodonga. Uh, Josh, can you explain further about how that design came to be? It sounds like a lot of passion, a lot of you've mentioned the investment that was put into it. Uh, just how did it happen? Yeah, so to put it into context, they were nail bag builders at the back of their ute. So at that stage in their career, it was on the dining room table at home, you know, like so many do. Um, they really had to invest outside of ours to make it happen. In those days too, so we're talking 80s, 90s, trusses were coming into fashion. So trusses are, uh, it's how construction is really done today. The alternative before that was pitching, hand pitching the roof with really heavy green timbers and greeners, unseasoned, very, you know, it's virtually lumber that's been cut out of the forest and you whack it on the roof, Mm. a little bit more in it, but yeah. So in those, in that period, Trusses were coming into vogue and so open plan living was coming into trend and the simple nature of trusses allowed you to have open plan living, but trusses had their limitations because they were still in their infancy of engineering. You couldn't actually do complex roof design. So they saw a real opportunity in this. Dad being Sparrow, (laughs) John obviously really skilled Max experience so they they had where in those days you had to there was no prefabrication so they were knocking up frames trusses windows they were doing them in probably say you know half the time of what others were doing because they wanted to make a cross but also build up their own business so they saw that as that's their niche they can really expand on that so they went down the path of this complex roof design which trusses cannot do but open plan living so they pitched hand pitched the roofs they used super like in terms of to get the 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 span of roof, they had to use very large members of steel. So it was quite backbreaking work. But what they created was this niche because they were utilizing their talents, and and in doing that, they were able to provide something that was aesthetically beautiful because they were providing open plan living with this complexity of roof design that was head scratching with, and that's the thing that when you drive past the B&H, there is gables over gables, changing roof directions, hips and valleys that are tight. It's a bit of a, a complicated roof that in totality looks just aesthetically beautiful. And, and so became the, the bell rose virtually. And, and with that, they invested, you know, into a lot of other, um, yeah, I suppose it's technology in a in a different sense. You know, we look at it differently today. But back then, you know, so using that green wood that I mentioned was yeah. other builders were coming from Melbourne and using that in their wall frames. But up here, we've got such hot summers, that timber was shrinking so much they were finding movement. So, you know, the technology was to use kiln-dried hardwood. So they were using that through their wall frames. Um, then they, you know, invested in unglazed terracotta tiles, which were starting to trend in Melbourne, sandstock bricks. It really became a synonymous look and and defining and it's just interesting from you know like i love i'm an interested person i love business as well and just from that perspective they probably didn't realize their business sense i suppose yeah they had it they were back you know it was aussie ingenuity that that sort of drove the success by the sounds of things like it it was where does guys that want to try something have a can-do attitude and we'll get into it and then invest in it further and believe in what we're doing yeah, I think there was a bit of that. There was no doubt there was a bit of design and construct going on at the, um, you know, at the source on the job site. But also a fair bit of research went into it. It was a considered, it wasn't, uncons- yeah, it was a very considered um, decision 
to create. I mean, obviously, you don't give everything of what you own to be able to create that for yeah. any, you know, you don't risk without knowing, I suppose, to some extent. And and so they did that. Yeah, they, they invested in their R&D and um, with good construction method, which we really, it's the same values that we practice today to do it as best it can be. And that's ultimately how they approached it. They really wanted to, and you know, it's a, something in the market that wasn't there. They, I mean, like I said, housing was quite simple. So simpler it is, the cheaper it is. Then it was like they're offering something premium that's quite, you know, at the other end of the um, economy scale. Yeah. And yet they drove a market that was there that people really did want it. So, yeah. Um, key decisions, forks in the road. They would have had a few. Yeah, 41 years of practice. There's always change, isn't there? And, and I suppose, I think it was doing the simple things really well and, and just trying to keep it simple but forks in the road yeah it's defining roles i think was really important john and max really drove production the standards subcontractor expectations the relationship julian was all about you know the administration and the business sense part of it so yeah it, they really had um great cohesion i think you know so knowing their role um you know, over the journey, so we're, we're this year, excitingly, we're starting our 25th display home, which is, yeah, I'm really proud of. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, longevity in business is, yeah, it relies on relationship. It's a community to build a home. So, you know, you're sort of nurturing a community for that many years is, you know, we've got fantastic relationship with it. I mean, we've got the best subbies. I believe that wholeheartedly. We Undoubtedly, we're, yeah. Yeah. Um, they love working for us. We love working for the, uh, with them. And, um, and so, and same with our suppliers, you know, we, we had fantastic support. Like I, you, you go back in the day and people in the industry, you know, will know them, how much they invested into it. You know, the Steve Mamuni for one, I know he, he's not necessarily related to the industry, but he was for us, um, from BMG was, yeah, can't thank him enough. For, and, and I know the same for the boys before me, you know, for what BMG have done for us has been, um, yeah, nothing short. It's friendship, to be honest, uh, uh, as much as, yeah, um, business. But, you know, th then there's the David Christie's who supported us with all the brickwork and the Wayne Ross's of TradeLink and Brendan Brown's and David Saltry's and Terry Towers and Cash. And there's these names that f throughout the journey that have been, yeah, really good to us. So, but forks in the road, yeah, it's, it's, I suppose it's knowing what you've got and appreciating it and nurturing it, I think, is probably... Sounds like Some you've got that. a handle on that at the moment, as you sit. Uh, what's it look like in the future? Have you, are you, how's your forward looking? Yeah, well, like I said, the 25th yeah. display home is bloody exciting, to be honest. I've invested the last, I don't know how long it took. Like I said, I was, a, I would have been 10, I think, at the time that the Bell Rose was being designed and evolving into what it was. So I kind of remember just the the bits and pieces of going, I've got no idea about timelines. It's, I'm, I'm working... Yeah, at the moment, it's been 18 months, this one in the can, and it's um, <laughs> it's finally being realised, and I'm really excited. I think it is the next phase, I suppose. Look, the, the Belrose series, we have really, um, you know, we grew it, the family of, the consistency, so that homes that we build today still are recognisable to that original design. Threads, we're talking, they're not identical. They're, you know, they've evolved into a contemporary version, but at the same time, um, th this version that I'm talking of, the 25th display home, is completely distinctly different. It is on another wave, and um, really excited to be able to produce it. Sure, it it's going to um, yeah embodies the the regional shed, which I absolutely love. And I know that sounds a bit funny in the gable of the yeah. thread of BH history, but it'll tie them together really nicely into a yeah really modern. Um, contemporary floor plan that is just nice and crisp. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's quite exciting to hear the passion behind your industry and, and that because for many people, even though you make a huge investment in a home and you might build a house, you just watch it go up and you go, it's a house. Um, do, you, do you still go through, and you take pride in it, but do you still go through the, um, you'd see your clients, I'd imagine, go through the whole, oh, is it only that big? Oh, no, it's bigger than we thought. The, anyone who's ever built a house or, or done some substantial building, that weird perception of, of room size 
does that happen for you when you're watching a house go up? Like even like a, a one Absol- that you've drawn? Or? Absolutely. It comes down, it's a trust thing, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I mean, you see so many of them, you understand what it will look like at the end. But at the same time, no, it's the, you know, that visual perception of just a slab down and you think, will my house fit on that? <laughs> <laughs> then the roofs go on and it gets a little bigger and then the plaster goes in and it goes, well, this is a bit bigger. How am I going to put on my stuff? You know, I need more furniture. Yeah. So <laughs> It it certainly yeah it's a natural thing and it's a common question for sure it's a natural so you're used to it we're talking to Josh Baker uh, from B and H Homes who is now the owner of the business and and we've heard him really proudly recount the story of those before him that established the business which um, Josh included your father and I guess unfortunately in recent years um, you've had to deal with uh, quite a bit of grief whilst also sinking your teeth into business at the same time. Um, for anyone not familiar with the story, please share the story with us um, of your father's passing and I guess he's being unwell for some time there. Yeah, uh, we, we had a blessed existence, real, and we do have a blessed existence. And um, I didn't really know a lot of hardship until that point. And I mean, it, and look, it's life at the end of the day and we've all experienced it. But yeah, dad passed away in 2017. It was... That year he retired. So he retired in the Jan 2017. He was going to dabble and we were going to, you know, he was going to work from afar and lead the good life and I was going to slog it out. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so still in directorship, but he just would have, yeah, really eased back into retirement. And unfortunately he got crook in, uh, you know, started to get some issues with swallowing. He had esophageal cancer. It developed. It became a really aggressive type of tumor um, to the point that you know one day he was able to swallow reasonably it still was had to have a bit of a wash down but the next day it was restricted to um, the day after that he couldn't even swallow his own saliva so he had all of the treatment that you go through traditional um, and then turn to alternative in a short eight month period it was pretty bloody devastating because anyone who knows dad knows how spirited he was as a human, that's for sure. And to see him fight and his body not respond to the treatment was, uh, disbelieving, I suppose. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we've, as a family, yeah, we're yeah, exceptionally tight nucleus and, um, not to have dad, our rock in it has certainly been a new normal that we've had to learn. Mm. That's a, it's devastating. The, so the, you were, you were getting into the business at that same point in time. How? Well, we were already in directorship together yeah. during that. Um, it but was taking just full reins. Oh, was ta- yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and it was. Just, I suppose. Look, I look back. We've had a. Yeah, it's been a bit of an interesting transition. You know, um, like forty-one years, you got to expect change. So that was the point that came. Just yeah, when you're trying to deal with a few other things at the same time. But look, that's just the way it rolls. That's life, isn't it? Get used to it. It set you off, and understandably so, I'd imagine, because uh, I've lost my sister um, to cancer myself, and, and it's until you have someone that's personally connected to you, you don't have a face on a disease. You know, we all, as good humans, mm. do fundraising and donate to things where we can, but until until you put a face to it, and I'm sure you'd relate to it, is, is that's when the passion for that um, belief or what can I do really kicks off. You ended up t- on the Tour de Cure um, mm. bandwagon. Yeah. It was something only... Four months before dad passed, my auntie passed as well with stomach cancer. So my uncle and I, and, and dad was, re- um, he received treatment not only here, and I cannot thank enough the, um, yeah, the private hospital in Albury of just yeah, phenomenal care that they gave was just outstanding. And then dad went to get, you know, the, the best that we could offer, what um, we could find, I suppose, what they could offer in at Peter Mac Cancer Centre. So Peter Mac Cancer Centre were aligned with the Tour de Cure. My uncle, uh, who also rides bike, my dad rides bikes. We, we rode bikes together. We really enjoyed just as a pastime. One of the many things we did, I mean, geez, we yeah, pretty much did everything together outside of work, inside work. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a natural normal thing to do I suppose it felt like that because you feel so helpless during the journey of watching someone with cancer go downhill you just are helpless and all that you want to do you can't and so certainly what's driven us is 
we want to see investment go into digestive cancers. Certainly the, the liver, stomach, esophageal, they're pricks of ones to get it. And uh, we'd love to see a little bit more into that. So that's why we, we hope anyway, some of the, over the journey now we've yeah, raised collectively, 100 cyclists do this ride. We go to Tasmania, we ride three days. Um, yeah, beat the drum a little bit. And before that, we, we raise as much money as we can. And over that period, I think we've raised close to 5 million in the last three or so years. It's been, yeah, pretty phenomenal. Um, making a small difference, that's what you can do. And, you know, I'd love to see... And look, they're making some big inroads with immunotherapy at the moment. I'd love to see the alternative therapies be invested in as well to augment that. So the... Yeah, to give the the chance of fighting um, hope, I suppose, because chemotherapy just, well, didn't work for us. And I know it is working certainly in other, in other cancers, but it near kills somebody before they can survive. So it'd be nice to augment what we've got in our body. And that's, you know, immunity that hopefully can, um, yeah, fight the cancers and immunotherapy is supporting that. So why not try and supplement it? And my sister's a naturopath, so obviously I've got a bit of a slanted view, but <laughs> I reckon, I reckon there's a, yeah, there's a lot of, um, green pastures there to be had. So you're still fundraising and riding? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So annually we do that. Uh, it's, yeah, it's close to my heart. It's, it's just something, it's a very little something that we can do. Hmm. We're on the journey this time around with Josh Baker from B and H Homes. We've heard a lot about that uh, proud local brand, and uh, we're finding out a little bit more about Josh now. And, and uh, one question I like to ask people, and and there's no right or wrong answer to this because it's really what you think they think. But how would other people describe Josh Baker? <laughs> Probably the first thing they'd say is late. <laughs> <laughs> I'd prefer to say generous with time. <laughs> So it's a work in progress, my punctuality. Uh, positive, determined, I would hope they might say. Probably if you would say pain the... Yeah. But uh, I'd say OCD. But anyway, look, who knows? Yeah, I'll leave that to them. Uh, what do you do with your spare time when you're not uh, dreaming up a new display home and, and working on the business? Uh, what are your hobbies? Love getting out and just moving. I love testing my body. So I love running and cycling, like I've mentioned. Surfing's a real passion of mine. Uh, That's tough to do in Albury Wodonga. It is a little, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I love travelling with my wife. So yeah, you know, we're often on a weekend. Yeah, our, our downtime certainly just get, you know, head out for brekkie or lunch and cafe, have a coffee, that sort of thing. So it's, yeah, it fills my cup. Let's, you've mentioned wife. We may as well go there now because I'm led to believe, um, I can't remember the full story in detail, but tell us how you met your wife. There's a good story behind this, isn't there? <laughs> there is. It was a sliding door moment, that's for sure. And I needed as much help as I could get down that alley of... <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> um, so a good friend of ours thought we'd be a great match. And so after a couple of attempted matchups, which is quite difficult because she's from Perth and I'm in Aubrey, so it's difficult to catch up. Those moments were only like a wedding here and there. So Sarah, who was our... Um, Shining light. Anyway, she said, hey, look, Nio's at home. She's waiting for a phone call. She's waiting for a phone call from you and she's got a glass of red wine in hand and she's home alone. So give her a buzz. So I did. I rang her up like it was she won the bloody tats lotto that night. <laughs> <laughs> Were you nervous making the call? Well, I, I wasn't because I was led to believe that she was waiting on that call. Okay. Little did she, she didn't even know who I was. So... <laughs> Congratulations, it's Josh speaking. Yeah. And she's like, who the hell are you almost? So um, anyway, after I got over that little awkward uh, um, <laughs> few minute exchange, we, we ended up chatting for another, yeah, 40 odd minutes. Um, I persisted. It's one of my um, traits. <laughs> and after a few more conversations, I said, hey, how about you just keep this date free? I'm going to come over and we'll see if we work. And so I did that, flew over to Perth. Nio flew back. A few weeks later, it just happened to be my auntie's 50th. There's only 70 people there. So she met all of the family in one go. <laughs> <laughs> Baptism of fire. She survived. And and um, and that's, yeah, the rest is history. So we've certainly, yeah, we went back and forth, obviously, quite a bit. And um, yeah, I jumped on my knee over there at one of those trips. And uh, I've been lucky enough to 
yeah, bring her home. What a great story. What a catch. Dad was very proud of me, I tell you. Was he? he? So <laughs> Dad, Dad got to see that all unfold, did he? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he thought it was the greatest. Considering that, like I said, my love life wasn't a, uh, <laughs> wasn't a lot to ride home about. <laughs> so, yeah, that was one of those sliding door moments where just, you know, things happen, isn't it? Yeah. You just, you go for it. I, yeah, I had no idea, obviously. Um, but uh, what would it, what would eventuate? That's a great story. Um, you got any good quotes? I love hearing people's quotes and philosophies and, and filters that they apply to their life. Is there anything that you sort of, you know, when something happens, you sort of run it through your head again and go, that's why? Or Yeah, I think um, follow your gut, trust your instinct and lead with your heart is a good one. I mean, not that that's, I don't know if that's any particular, I just think they're little mantras that, you know, I, I try and yeah be true to. I think if you're authentic in anything you do, it leads to success and you don't do it conditionally for success. You do it just because, so that's probably what I think, you know, you get nothing for nothing. So anything worth anything, you got to do something for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably what I'd go on. What keeps you motivated each day? It's a good question. Uh, I would, I just think, yeah, life. I generally have a real thirst for, it. I love it. I just, yeah. Um, try to, be the best version. I know that's real cliche. Yeah. Particularly, you know, you, I love podcasts and all that sort of stuff where they, they do, you know, those things that talk about it. But at the same time, yeah, generally I just, yeah, I, yeah, I just get, get a real kick out of um, just trying to see where things end up when you give it a good crack. Do you think that's changed and maybe emphasized in a positive way um, since your father passed away? Um, not really. No, I've always, yeah, I'm, I think just, Growing up, I suppose it's probably just been embedded from mum and dad. Like if you were to ask me, you know, who I admire, it'd be, yeah, mum and dad's story from humble beginnings or all of the story, you know, from John, Max as well. Like that's our Ben H story from humble beginnings to, um, you know, we're not, you know, madly successful in any stretch. I'm not yeah, suggesting that, but at the same time, yeah, made a goal of it and, and made good. So that's certainly... Um, has been embedded in us kids, my sisters, you know, um, trust yourself and, um, yeah, and give it a go. So, that, yeah, it's probably just environmental. Lucky to be born into the family I was. Mm. Every b home that you drive past is really a legacy of Dad's work with, with the others as well that you mentioned. Uh, do you think you'll have something that you that you sort of, uh, people can look back on and go, you know, that's, that's, that's still there, it's still giving? Yeah, I hope so. Definitely, this this twenty fifth display home. <laughs> I, I really it's got the heart and soul in it. It it's has, the, like yeah. I said. I mean, it's actually it's got a little bit of my my cousins been involved in it. So I used, to give you a little bit more brief on um, on when I joined the business. Like mum was working there too. My cousins. So I'm working with mum, dad, uncles, cousins. Today, fast forward, there mum and dad. Well, actually, mum is still involved as a yeah silent partnership there. But um, you know still working with cousins. I'm actually, yeah, been working with my cousin um, in Melbourne a little bit as well. He's an architect. So it's really lovely to have um, that family. I mean, the, the company's founded on family values, but to, yeah, to carry that through into this next phase still is really important to me. And uh, yeah, that that's something that I suppose will, will always be because it's, it's a part of our culture. Mm. Um yeah, something as a as a legacy I would like to do. And it was something that Dad started off. You know, it, it, go, it probably stems back to that idealistic Josh back in uni days, you know, wanted to help out. And, you know, that's that's going to be a work in progress. But hopefully, yeah, what will happen with, um, yeah, in, into the future might be uh, something that supports those doing it tough that, you know, don't have a roof over, like, doesn't it not make sense that the building industry, you know, supports those that, that don't have a roof over, that, that are homeless. So I hope that, yeah, we can put together some form of system as a building industry and community and some loose things we'll put in place with Dad and we had a few discussions over it that will support that, you know, be that a levy when you go through council that just, you know, continually tops up so every new home that gets built, any permit that gets done, um, it can go towards supporting housing that is for, 
you know, if it's full time, half time, you know, like mm. um, stop over type of housing, you know, like it's, it's so necessary, isn't it? I mean, domestic violence, mm. what's been happening, it's critical to have that sort of infrastructure. So hopefully, yeah, that, that would be something in the future that I would, I would love to be able to um, help. I'm not saying that's going to be, you know, being H homes alone, it's got to be a community Led. Yeah. Hey, that that one concept and idea has got my attention. How far percolated is that idea? What, at what point do you find someone to support legislation, perhaps surrounding it, or mm. or how do you build build together as an industry to to achieve that? Is that something you have to still lead? Are you aware of others feeling the same way? Or yeah, um, it was Quamby House, which we used to have in Aubrey. Obviously, mm. was something that. Yeah, real tragedy, I think, that what happened there in terms of... And obviously, yeah, Dad was as well. He certainly started the conversation with a, a representative from um, council, I think also Quamby. He might have had some real initial conversation. Uh, life got in the way. Hmm. And so it didn't probably get to the, the level. But that's where, you know, that retirement that he was going to do because he was, yeah, he enjoyed, yeah, doing... And so, you know, that was going to be another thing that was on the radar. I'd love to try and see that through. And, um, yeah, so in answer to your question, yeah, it's certainly, it's not going to be one person. It's a community-led thing. And, yeah, sure, I, I would think it needs to be um, put into local council as a, as a, I think, you know, every new construction supports that. We're talking with Josh Baker from B&H Homes. He's part of the journey this time around. And uh, we've spoken building industry. Um, we've spoken grief. We've spoken all sorts of different things so far. But uh, hindsight, it's a wonderful thing, Josh. <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, is there advice you would have given a younger you? Good question. I, I certainly have a tendency to try and do things too good sometimes. So I would say... 80% today is better than 100% in three weeks' time. So don't <laughs> procrastinate, get the buddy thing done, <laughs> and it'll be good enough. I love it. 80% today instead of 100% in two weeks' time. It's good enough, exactly. <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> um, if you were able to have three people at the dinner table, or maybe not, limit yourself to three, who would you like to have dinner with, alive or dead, um, famous, family, it doesn't matter who it is? Who yeah, like I think the obvious one is obviously Dad. Yeah. I'd have him back any day. Um, bit of a man crush on Nathan Buckley. Like I said, I, I love the way people try and be their best, and he certainly reinvented himself, you know. So, yeah, I wouldn't mind having a chew on his ear to find out how we went about it. Um, probably, you know, I bloody love spending time with your family, so I'd have my wife and family. So, yeah. Yeah, good one. Um, sweet or savoury? No, nah, there's no doubt about it. I'm all sweet. Yeah. Favourite? You got a favourite you go to, like a dessert or? Jeez. Um, anything really that you see in those little glass cabinets next to a coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an absolute sucker for it. <laughs> Virtually, yeah, I will chew on any of that. Um, anything down at Nord Bakery. Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, uh, everybody has different beliefs for afterlife, but if you came back, who would you come back as, or what would you come back as? Yeah, look, Kelly Slater would be a. That's the surfing not, thing. Not, oh. yeah, not a, not a bad way to live, is it? You sort of just hop around the islands and, um, yeah, maybe pick up a board every now and again. I love it. What are your plans for the weekend before we go? Actually, we're. I'm really excited about it. This Saturday morning, we are trying out the urban surf pool down at Tullamarine. So it's that. Artificial Great. wave pool, yeah, which would be awesome. So yeah, I get to surf at the airport, and apparently it doesn't hurt if you fall off. Is that right? Well, or? I don't know about that. It's concrete. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait and see. And I got a mate's fortieth, so oh, that'll be enjoyable. Best of luck for that, Joshua Baker from B and H Homes. You've got an amazing story. Your your late father had an amazing story before you even came on the scene. So thanks for sharing a bit of that, um, sharing a bit of your thoughts and feelings through that journey, and, and a bit about your business and yourself as well. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you as part of the journey. Thanks, Kev. Really enjoyed it.